So now we'd like to start with the lecture proper. It's about the shoulder and the knee. I know that you're in the middle of a course of the limbs of the locomotor system. I asked Anton Tonchev whether you have studied the shoulder and the knee. His answer was yes. So you have a lot of prior knowledge, which is great. This also means that it's highly likely that I will tell some things that you already know. I always say, enjoy those moments. It's just great to hear something that you know, some, that you know already, because it proves that you are having knowledge. On the other hand, I might have a different approach. I will tell you some, some clinical applications. And uh, there's a big chance that you will hear some new things as well. I will start with making a comparison between the upper and the lower limb. Then we go to the shoulder girdle and the shoulder joint, the knee joint, and finally a few remarks about the bursae. But first, let's start to compare the upper and the lower limbs. Of course, there are many differences between the upper and the lower limbs. But many differences are related to an essential difference in function because our lower limb is important for weight bearing. We are standing upright, we are walking, the weight of our body is transmitted to the floor via our pelvis and our lower limb. So that's an essential function of our lower limb. In our upper limb, it's different. Our upper limb is not meant to do this. Okay, you can do it if you are a gymnast, but most of us are not walking on our hands. So our upper limb has a different uh, meaning. It should be mobile. The essential function of the upper limb is to get our hands in an optimum position for manipulating. Our hands are very special, very special for human be beings. We can manipulate in many nice ways, so we should have an optimal position and therefore there's a lot of mobility in our upper limb. You can say some of the stability has been sacrificed in favor of mobility. And you will find this back in several differences. For example, as you know, our extremities are connected to the trunk by bony girdles. So in the shoulder, we have the shoulder girdle, or the pectoral girdle, if you wish, which consists of the clavicula and the scapula. And in the lower limb, we have the pelvic girdle. And the difference is that the pelvic girdle is a closed girdle, because we have two hip bones connected in the midline by the symphysis, the pubic symphysis, and here they are connected to the os sacrum. So that's really closed girdle. Um, the shoulder girdle is attached to the sternum by the clavicula, but on the posterior side you see that the scapulae don't have an articulation with another bone. They're just hanging free in many muscles. So that's one difference. A second difference, when you compare the shoulder joint and the hip joint, you will notice that the head of the femur is rather hidden inside the so-called acetabulum, which is the socket of the hip joint. But this is a very stable configuration. If you look at the shoulder joint, you will notice that this head of the humerus is completely visible, because the socket on the scapula, and we will see it in more detail later on, is very shallow. We have differences in flex flexion and extension sites, because if we are taking an anatomical position like this, the flexion sites in our upper limb is here, on the ventral side, while the flexion sites in our lower limb is on the dorsal side. That's a difference as well. I'll come back to that later in two minutes. And in the upper limb, we are able to pronate our forearm, and that's not possible in our uh, leg. And it has to do with the fact that we should be able to have some rotation here. If you grip firmly your forearm, then you will notice that the, the range of movements in our wrist joint are flexion and extension, and abduction and adduction, you will know that, but impossible to rotate your wrist. There's no rotation possibility in your wrist. Still, it's necessary to make these movements. And this movement is taking place in the forearm because the radius is able to turn around the ulna. And this movement is called pronation. If we go back, it's called supination. Specifically for the upper limb, not possible in the lower limb because then we would sacrifice stability. So we have seen 
this. This is a special occasion, but most people don't do it. Now, our hand is very special. Um, if you ask me, which are differences, very important differences between humans and animals, I would say two things. First, the enormous development of the cortex of our brain. Second, our hands. Our hands is a very fine tool for manipulation. You can do surgery, you can play a musical <coughs> instrument, whatever you wish. It is very uh, well developed and you can command it in a pretty precise way. The range of movements in our arm is that big that you can easily reach every part of your back without any difficulty. Then about, about the differences in the flexion sites between the upper and lower limbs. Um, we are rather born symmetrically and if you take a look at evolution, you may remember if you have a look at, for example, a reptile, if you take a crocodile, a crocodile has knees which are pointing outside in the lateral direction. The same holds true for his elbow, so he's moving this way. This is how a crocodile moves. What has happened to human? Our upper limbs have had an exo-rotation. It's a lateral rotation. And therefore, the flexion side has moved to the ventral, the anterior side. At the same time, and also happening during embryology, during development, our lower limb undergoes a medial rotation. So upper limb, lateral rotation, lower limb, medial rotation, and therefore the flexion side is on the dorsal side. And this is useful, because when in our upper limb we have a flexion side on the ventral side, it is very useful to combine hand and eye movements so we have optimal hand-eye coordination. If the flexion side was here and we would have to manipulate like this, it would not, would not be very convenient. And in a similar vein, if we have in our lower limb the flexion side on the dorsal side, it's very good for walking and for propulsion. It's much better than if it would have been on the ventral side. Once in my life I saw a science fiction film and these aliens had flexion sides on the ventral side of the knees. It was Amazing, so stupid. I don't understand why they do it. It, it looked ridiculous, actually. Okay, so this is an, an, an essential difference as well between the upper and the lower limb. Okay, now let's start with the shoulder girdle and the shoulder joint. Um, as said, the shoulder girdle comprises the, oh, sorry, the clavicula and the scapula. And the shoulder joint is this one, is a joint between the scapula and the humerus. Here we can see in detail that the shoulder girdle is an open girdle, because on the posterior side the scapula is not articulating with the thoracic wall with any other bone. It is really suspended in many muscles and that's important for its function as well. To appreciate the function of the shoulder joints and the shoulder girdle, it's good to have a look at the three joints which are essential in this region. The first joint is the joint which connects the clavicle, the clavicula, to the trunk. And that's a connection between the clavicula and the sternum. And therefore, co therefore it's called articulatio sternoclaviculares, and you may know that ART is an abbreviation for articulatio, which means joint. So articulatio sternoclaviculares is the first joint to consider. A second joint will be this one, between the clavicula and the acromion of the scapula, therefore it's called articulatio <coughs> acromio clavicularis. And the third one is the shoulder joint proper, is this one, it's called articulatio humeri or articulatio gleno humeralis. Both words, both terms are okay to indicate the shoulder joint. We start with this joint, it has an impressive range of motion, it's really very mobile. Um, when you have a close look at the joint surfaces, they have the shape of, of, of saddles, 
But the improvement, I, I mean the mobility, is really improved by the presence of a discus. Inside the sternoclavicular joint, there is an articular disc. And this discus really improves the range of movement. And therefore, it has three axes of movement and it functions as a ball and socket joint. I'm not really sure if you know the term ball and socket joint, you know that. It's a ball, it's this, like the shoulder, like the hip, so it has an enormous range of movement, three axes of movement. And thanks to including this articular disc, we have three axes of movement as well. So this is a normal ball and socket joint. It doesn't look like it, but it functions like it. It means this is a lateral view, this is a lateral uh, ending of the clavicle. You can move it in an anterior direction, you can move it in a posterior direction, you can elevate the clavicula, you can depress it, but you can also rotate it around its axis. And you can try it yourself. If you grab, you grab your own clavicle between thumb, you put your thumb behind your clavicula and your index, index finger in front of it and then Grab it firmly, <laughs> not so firm, <laughs> and then you elevate your arm in a sideways direction, you will feel that it is rotating. It is rotating. It can rotate around its, its axis, so therefore it has three axes <coughs> of movement. So the second one, Articulatio acromioclavicularis, is rather stable. It has very firm ligaments around it. It's not very mobile actually. Just a little bit of sliding action, but that's a bit about it. Just a little bit. And here we see the so-called cavitas glenoidalis, which is the rather shallow socket of the shoulder joint. You see how shallow it is, so we come back to that later. Now, how should we understand the function of the clavicula and the scapula? By other words, how should we understand the function of the shoulder girdle? Um, we normally define the movements of this girdle as movements of the scapula. Because the scapula is suspended in many muscles. Many muscles attach to the scapula, they pull the scapula. And therefore we say what is possible, we can elevate the scapula, we can depress the scapula, you can have a protraction, it means the scapula moves along the thoracic wall in a forward direction. You can have a retraction, it means it goes in a posterior direction. And you can have a rotation as well, we call it lateral, English call it upward rotation, or medial or downward rotation. And I will show you a movie, because these things are best visible in movies. And it means if you are pulling the scapula by the muscles, the clavicula is automatically following because the acromioclavicular joint is not very mobile. So once you're pulling the scapula, the clavicula automatically will follow the scapula and therefore the real movement is taking place in the sternoclavicular joint. And therefore you need this enormous range of movement in the sternoclavicular joint. I'm going to show this movie. Um, there Officially should be some sounds. I'm not really sure if it is audible, and otherwise I will give my own comments. Here's the sternoclavicular joint. Strong supporting ligaments between the clavicle and the sternum, behind and in front, and between the clavicle and the first ribs beneath, keep the two bones together. The sternoclavicular joint has an impressive range of motion, down and up, and backward and forward. So you see, if you move the clavicula, movement is now taking place the in the sternoclavicular joint. Relative to the trunk. Upward movement is called elevation. Downward movement is called depression. Forward movement around the trunk is called protraction. The opposite movement is retraction. This movement is called upward rotation because it points the glenoid fossa upward. The opposite is downward rotation. In real life, these movements are often combined. For example, a combination of elevation and upward rotation. So it means that movements in the shoulder girdle really reinforce 
amplify the movements in the shoulder joint. So let's now have a look at the shoulder joint itself, articulatio humeri. Um, it is a ball and socket joint, but we've seen the cavitas glenoidalis, which is the socket, is very shallow. And therefore, it's not very stable position to have the head of the humerus inside the cavitas glenoidalis. Of course, there is a surrounding capsule. If we have a synovial joint, it should be a surrounding capsule, so we have it. But this capsule is extremely loose and wide. Actually, the head of the humerus would fit twice inside this capsule. It's so wide. And this means capsule and a few ligaments which are there and the shape of the bones are not offering a very stable configuration. But in our local motor system, there's a third option to provide stability. So the first one is the shape of the bones. The second is the presence of ligaments and the capsule. The third option is muscle activity. And that's what we essentially need. I'm quite sure you heard about the muscles of the rotator cuff. Is that right? Not so right? Okay, so there is a, um, a group of four muscles surrounding the shoulder joints. All together they're called the rotator cuff because three of the four muscles are able to give um, uh, lateral or medial rotation in the shoulder joint. But the second important function of these strong muscles is that they really stabilize the shoulder joint. So these are the muscles of the rotator cuff. That is very important. Then the shoulder joint itself is a ball and socket joint. It means it enables flexion and extension, abduction and adduction, you know these terms, I know, and lateral and medial rotation. That's possible. If you have a look at um, dissecting, dissection specimen and you try to mimic these movements, you will notice that abduction is only possible for about 85, perhaps 90 degrees. Then it stops because uh, a tubercle on the humerus makes contact with the acromion of the scapula. Still, for me, no problem to elevate my arm further. How would that be possible? Who knows the answer? Anyone who want to give it a try? I think I hear the right answer, because my Bulgarian is very good. Of course, it's a shoulder curl which is helping. So if we have um, a sideways elevation of the upper limb, it's a combination of abduction in the shoulder joint, and simultaneously, after 30 degrees of abduction, the lateral rotation of the scapula is taking place. So it's a combination of shoulder girdle and shoulder joint. And that's the ascension of the shoulder region and this provides a wide range of movements which is very useful to uh, bring our hands in a very good position for, for manipulation. This collaboration between the shoulder girdle and the shoulder joint has been called the scapulohumeral rhythm, which is a very nice word, I think. Another example how the scapula moves upon various movements of the upper limb. So this was the first part about the shoulder. Now let's continue with the knee joint. Um, the knee joint is the biggest and perhaps the most complex joint of our body. It's also very vulnerable and this has two reasons. The first reason is that the forces in our knee joint are enormous. Because our lower limb is weight-bearing, it means forces become bigger the lower you get in our lower limb. So the forces upon the knee joint are very big actually. A second reason is the knee joint is rather superficial. It's not surrounded by uh, protecting muscles or fat. You can easily feel, easily palpate the structures of the knee joint. So it is really vulnerable. In ascension, primarily, it's a hinge joint. And this is a, hin a typical hinge joint. 
but the knee doesn't have this shape. And the normal hinge joint has one axis of movement, which is flexion and extension. Still, in the knee, especially when the knee is flexed, some rotation is possible. And this rotation, the possibility of rotation might be useful as well. I come back to that later. So, it is a synovial joint, and a synovial joint should, should have a head and a socket. But in the case of the knee joint, we have two heads and two sockets. So the heads are on the femur, femur. we call them the femoral condyles, there's a medial condyle and a lateral condyle. And the sockets are on the tibia, and these sockets are very flat, and therefore they're quite often called the tibial plateaus, officially tibial condyles, but quite often called the tibial plateaus because they're very flat. The fibula is not involved in the knee joint. We have a patella, which articulates with the femur as well, and I will show you that in the end of this lecture. If we have a medial view on the medial femoral condyle and the me medial tibia plateau, you will notice that those joint surfaces don't fit so well. We say there's an incongruity. They don't fit so well. And if joint surfaces don't fit very well, you quite often see the insertion of little pieces of cartilage to help to create a better match. And this is happening in the knee joint. Two semilinear shaped of cartilages are inserted inside the joints between the femur and the condyle, and these are the well-known menisci. Now, if we remove the femur and we take a superior view, on the tibia plateaus, including the menisci, it looks like this. We have a medial and a lateral tibia plateau. This is the medial meniscus, is the lateral meniscus. The medial meniscus is the biggest one of the two, and the medial meniscus has three sides of attachment, here, here, and also here, while the lateral meniscus only has two sides of attachment. And therefore, the medial one is the most vulnerable if you have a problem, for example, a tear in a, in a meniscus, most of the times it will be a problem in the medial meniscus. It's more fixed, therefore less flexible, and it's the biggest one. Still, okay, this is nice. If we insert these two uh, menisci, we have a kind of a better, better match, better socket. Still, um, the bony configuration and the menisci don't give much stability. So, again, we need other factors, and in the knee joints we have two factors which create stability. First, it's the ligaments. Second, it's the muscle action. And we have many ligaments in and around the knee joints. I will just show you the four most important ones. Two of them are the so-called collateral ligaments, one on the medial side, which is called the ligamentum collaterale tibiale. It's the medial collateral ligament over here. And one is on the lateral side, this one. It's called the ligamentum collaterale fibulare. It's the lateral collateral ligament. So the function of these collateral ligaments is holding the femur and the tibia together. That's one function. But also we should prevent abduction and adduction. It would not be very useful if my leg, my lower leg, would be able to make movements in this direction or in this direction. That is not what it's supposed to do. And those collateral ligaments prevent abduction and adduction. So if you have a tear in one of these ligaments, you will have abnormal movements, either abduction or adduction. The other ligaments are inside the joints. They are not really inside the joint cavity because the ligaments themselves are covered by synovial membrane, but they are really inside the joints. They are the well-known cruciate ligaments. So how are we looking at this picture? In this way, someone is sitting on the table and, oh, <laughs> I hope this is going all right, sitting on the table and you are looking this way to the femur condyles. Hmm. And then 
you see the two cruciate ligaments. The importance of the cruciate ligaments is to prevent the femur from rolling of the tibia during flexion and extension. And again, this can best be demonstrated by a movie. And let's see if now it works. Still have to find it again. Here's the anterior cruciate ligament, seen from in front. Here's the posterior cruciate ligament, seen from behind. To get a better look at them, we'll remove the lateral condyle of the femur. Now we can see the whole of the anterior cruciate ligament. The anterior cruciate ligament goes from here on the tibia to here on the femur, on the inner aspect of the lateral condyle. The anterior cruciate ligament prevents the femur from moving backward in relation to the tibia. Now we'll look at the posterior cruciate ligament. We'll remove the anterior cruciate ligament to see it better. The posterior cruciate ligament goes from here on the femur to here on the back of the tibia. The posterior cruciate ligament stops the femur from moving forward on the tibia. By preventing backward and forward movement, the cruciate ligaments ensure that the condyles of the femur stay in one place as they roll on the condyles of the tibia. Without them, it would roll off the back of the tibia in flexion and would roll up the front of it in extension. So we've seen that thanks to the presence of these cruciate ligaments, the femur and the tibia stay in line when you have flexion and extension, and otherwise that would not be possible. So, this also means that if you have a rupture of one of those cruciate ligaments, you would have abnormal mobility. So, if there's a rupture of the anterior cruciate ligaments, it would be possible to pull the lower leg farther in a forward direction than in the normal situation. And we call this an anterior drawer sign. A drawer is something that you can open to put things in. It's just that you can, just like you're opening a drawer. In a similar vein, if you have a rupture in a posterior cruciate ligament, the posterior movement will be bigger than on the norm normal uh, conditions. Now, about the movements in the knee joint. Of course, primarily a hinge joint, permitting flexion and extension. When the knee is in extension, all ligaments are tightened. Both collateral and cruciate ligaments are tightened. It means that rotation normally is not possible. If you have a bit of flexion in your knee joint, you can rotate a little bit. But if you extend the knee joint, a forced rotation takes place, and this is called the screw home motion. The screw home mechanism takes place during ex extension, and this makes the knee extremely stable. And I will explain you how this works. If you want to have maximum stability in a joint, it's important that the contact between the articulating surfaces is maximum, is as big as possible. Now look at this joint, and again, I hardly dare to sit on this table, I do it like this. <laughs> again, we're looking at the patient from this direction. So, the tibia and fibula are hanging down, and the femur is going in a posterior direction because the patient is sitting on the table. This is the medial femoral condyle, and this is the lateral femoral condyle. As you can see, the medial one is by far the biggest of the two. Now, if we extend our knee, the tibia, and also fibula, will pointing in our direction, and you see, at this moment, there's maximum contact between the lateral tibia plateau and the lateral femoral condyle. But because the medial femoral condyle is bigger, this part of this femoral condyle is not making contact 
yet with the medial tibia plateau. And you want to have that. So what we can do, if we have a lateral rotation of the tibia, then we have maximum contact. And this always takes place when you extend your knee. It's a forced rotation, which should happen, which automatically happen. You don't have to think of that. And this gives maximum contact between the articulated <coughs> surfaces. We call it the screw home, uh, sorry, the screw home motion. And if we are standing upright, just like now, with my both knees in extension, I know two things. First, my four most important ligaments are tightened. It means both collateral and the cruciate ligaments. Second, my knee is in the screw home uh, position. And this makes my knee, even without muscle action, a very stable column. I don't need much muscle action to just keep standing. So that's a very energy sparing mechanism, this screw home uh, mechanism. Of course, it's only if the tibia is not weight bearing that it can be an extra rotation. Because if I'm standing, my feet are making contact to the floor. So this means that it's not possible to have extra rotation of the tibia because the tibia is fixed uh, through my ankle joints to the ground. But of course we still have a hip joint. And you have the same situation if you are not having an ex uh, sorry, a lateral rotation of the tibia, but you also can have a medial rotation of the femur. So if you're standing, we also have the screw, screw home uh, motion, but then it's caused by medial rotation of the femur. So finally, a few remarks about the bursae. First about the patella, what, why do we have a patella? So the patella is very important for the function of this main extensor muscle of the knee joint called musculus quadriceps femoris. I'm quite sure you know this one because it changes the angle of attachment of the uh, knee tendon and that is very uh, adventitious for uh, its function. Then about bursae, what is a bursa? A bursa is a sac, it's a closed sac, it's made of synovial membrane, it contains fluid and you find normally many bursae around joints because bursae are able to uh, provide a sliding plane. For example, if you contract this muscle, quadriceps femoris, the tendon should move upon the femur. So we need a gliding plane between the tendon and the femur and such a bursa can provide a gliding plane. Also, between the skin and the patella, there is a bursa to enable movement of the skin over the patella. So if we have movements, there should be some gliding or sliding plane and bursae provide a sliding plane. Moreover, they reduce friction. They can really um, disseminate the, 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 uh, the pressure. So it's, it's, it's very important to, uh, to withstand pressure as well. <coughs> but bursae can become irritated. If you're <coughs> sitting on your knees quite often, you can have an irritated bursa prepatellaris. And this is called the housemaid's knee, because especially in previous times, in early times, the housemaid was sitting on her knee while weeping the floor, like this, sweeping the floor, I should say. There's also something like a bursa on the olecranon, on the elbow, and that one provides uh, movement and facilitates movement of the skin over the olecranon. And if that one becomes irritated, it's called a student's elbow. Because students quite often sit like this in the <laughs> at the lectures. So, okay, this was the last slide. So to summarize a few things. First, we have seen the shoulder girdle is very mobile. It's essential for hand positioning. It's enormously um, um, gives a wide range of movement and freedom. Second, we've seen that the sternoclavicular joints is important for the mobility of the shoulder girdle because it's the muscles that attach to the scapula which move and the clavic clavicula is following and the movement then is taking place in articulatio sternoclavicularis. Third, we've seen that for stability in the shoulder joint we cannot rely on the shape of the bones we cannot rely on the capsule, which is very wide and very loose, 
So we need the muscles of the rotator cuff, four muscles for stability, very important. And we have seen how the shoulder girdle and the joints uh, combine their actions in movements of the upper limb and we call this collaboration, the scapulohumeral rhythm. Then the knee joints primarily is a hinge joint permitting flexion and extension. We need ligaments and muscles for stability because the shape of the bones with the flat tibia plateaus even if you insert a menisci is not so favorable for stability. And we have seen there's a screw home mechanism which is an extra rotation, sorry, a lateral rotation of the tibia or a medial rotation of the femur. And this gives a very stable column when you're standing, when you're in extension in the knee joint. Finally, the bursae are very important to uh, enable movements and also to reduce friction. So that was about it. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, please feel free.